go from chapter 13 to chapter 14. We are still on the first missionary journey. John Mark has dropped out. There are just two missionaries now, Paul and Barnabas. They come to a place called Iconium. As is their habit, they enter the synagogue of the Jews. And there's a great multitude there who believed both Jews and Gentiles. But the Jews who did not believe tried to turn the Gentiles against the apostles. And uh, there were signs and wonders which were worked, but the city was divided. Verse five, 4 says, some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Let me just tell you that there are many divisions in the world. There are socialists and there are capitalists. There are males and there are females. There are slaves and they're free. There are um, white people and there are dark-skinned people. There are atheists and there are religious people. There are poor people and there are rich people. There are all kinds of divisions in the world. But there's only one division which will last. Those who believe the apostles' teaching and those who don't believe it. Those who receive the gospel and those who don't receive the gospel. All the other divisions, racial divisions, economic divisions, political divisions, gender divisions, none of them will matter. None of them, none of them will last. Only one division will last. Those who believe the message that these men are preaching and those who don't believe it. That is the ultimate and the final division. That will determine who are the sheep and who are the goats, who are on God's right hand and who are on God's left hand. But when the gospel is preached, divisions emerge. And sometimes divisions emerge even among families. Some in the family believe, some in the family do not believe. And verse 4 talks about this division, Acts 14.4. The multitude of the city was divided. Some sided with the Jews and some sided with the apostles. And an attempt was made to stone them. Now we have to ask the question, um, I think we looked at this yesterday. What do you do when you're persecuted? Well, when Paul was persecuted in Damascus in Acts chapter 9, he escaped from the city by going over the wall at night in a basket. Here they tried to kill them in Iconium, so they flee to other cities, Lycaonia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. Now when they come to Lystra, this is just a part of Asia Minor, something amazing happens. They're preaching. What does the word preach mean? It means to announce. It means to tell out. It means to make a declaration. Um, we have a word in English called placard, and a placard is a sign. You remember how in the communist days on May Day when the armies would go by the Kremlin Wall and all the communist officials would be up there, and then in the earlier days, in the 30s and 40s, they would have big pictures on sticks, and on the pictures were pictures of Lenin and Stalin and Marx and Engels. Remember that? Those are placards. To preach is to placard something, to put it up on the top of a pole so everybody can see it and everybody can get the message. That's what they're doing. They're announcing the good news of the gospel. Now, there is a man in Lystra, these people are in every city in Acts 14, 8, who can't walk. He's like the man beside the gate in Acts 3. He's like the man called Aeneas in Acts 9. Here we, here we find another man who can't move his legs. And he was listening to Paul. And Paul noticed him in the crowd. And verse 9 says that Paul could tell that he had the faith to be healed. How did Paul do that? I don't know. I guess it had something to do with the Holy Spirit. 
Paul saw something that no one else can see. And let me tell you a principle of the spiritual life. Only those who see the invisible can do the impossible. Paul sees the invisible, and he's about to do the impossible. He sees the faith in the man's heart to be healed, and then he heals him. Now, there's a great, great lesson in what happens in Lystra on that day. He said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and he leaped up and he began to walk. And when the multitude saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, voice saying in the Lycaonian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. They thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods, and they began to worship them. Now, they said this in their own language. Here's what that means. It means that at first, Paul and Barnabas did not know what was going on. They did not know that they were being worshipped because the people were praising them in the language that Paul and Barnabas could not understand. Paul and Barnabas were probably preaching in Greek, which all educated people in the first century in the Mediterranean world understood the language that the New Testament was written in. These people had a local language a language that was peculiar to that region in Asia Minor, the Lycaonian language. Paul and Barnabas didn't know what was happening. Now, we're about to see a pattern here. In Acts 10, Cornelius tries to worship Peter, and Peter stops him. In Acts 12, the people who needed Herod's help begin to worship him, and he doesn't stop them, and he's struck dead. Now, these people in Lystra try to worship Paul and Barnabas. And when Paul and Barnabas realize what's happening, they stop them. In Acts chapter 12, I told you about the historical background of what happened with Herod. It's related to us by the Jewish historian who lived in Rome called Josephus. There is actually a historical background behind this event which happens in Lystra in Acts chapter 14. And we find it, we, we find the background in Greek mythology. As a matter of fact, we read about it, well, actually we read about it in Roman mythology. There was a Roman writer called Ovid, O-V-I-D, a famous Roman writer. He wrote a book called The Metamorphosis. In The Metamorphosis, he shares a legend, a myth that was believed by these people who lived in this place. It was a myth about the gods visiting their neighborhood. There was a Greek and Roman myth which declared that in this area, about a thousand years earlier, Zeus and Hermes, Zeus the king of the gods, and Hermes the messenger of the gods, the Romans called them Jupiter and Mercury had visited this very place. They disguised themselves as poor people. They knocked on a thousand doors asking for help. Nobody would help them. After they knocked on a thousand doors, they knocked on the door of an old couple called Philemon and Bouches. And Philemon and Bouches helped them and showed them hospitality. They then built a great mansion for a great palace for Philemon and Bouches, and they destroyed the homes of the thousand families who offered them no help. That was a myth, but that was a myth which was believed by people in the neighborhood. So, Paul and Barnabas appear, and they work a great miracle. What do the people think? They've come back. We're not going to blow it this time. So they begin to worship them. This is what's happening in Acts 14. In verse 11 says, The gods have become like men and have come down to us. This is what they're saying in their language. Paul and Barnabas does not understand them. Verse 12, They begin calling Barnabas Zeus, 
we know from ancient tradition that Paul was not very impressive physically. We even know that the Corinthians said this about him in 1 Corinthians 10. He makes a reference to what the Corinthians were saying about the way he looked. So they probably looked at Paul and thought, well, this could not be the king of the gods. This couldn't be Zeus because, I mean, look at him. But he's doing most of the talking, so this must be the messenger of the gods. This must be Hermes. They begin calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because Paul was the chief speaker and Hermes was the messenger of the gods. So there was a pagan priest to Zeus at the temple, at the local temple. So he brought an oxen and he wanted to sacrifice oxen to Paul and Barnabas as a way of worshiping them. And then when they realized what was happening, they tore their robes to show that they protested what was going on. Now let me tell you something. Um, I've got a coat on. In Budapest, I probably have five other coats like this. In Memphis, I've got three or four other coats like this. In the year 2011, people from North America have lots of coats. In the first century, these people would have probably had one set of clothes, maybe two set of clothes. If they tore their clothes, they were destroying at least half of what they had to wear, maybe all of what they had to wear. They were serious in their opposition to being worshipped. One of the great problems we have in Christianity today is we have so many ministry superstars, people who are on television, people who draw great crowds, people who have a great following, people who collect a lot of money every month, people who build big buildings and pay for television time and radio time, people who are adored by crowds. Some of these people may be honest and good, some of these people may not be so honest or so good. But one thing is clear. These missionaries didn't want any credit to come to them, which should go to God. And they seriously showed that they did not want to be worshipped by tearing their clothes and protesting that this was not going to go on. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amounts, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. Paul says in verse 15, Why are you doing all these things? We are also men of the same nature as you. We preach the gospel to you in order that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. What vain things? Worshipping idols. Worshipping men believing myths. Those are empty things which cannot satisfy the soul, which cannot bring the power of holiness into your personal moral life, and which cannot bring forgiveness of sins when you die. Those are vain and empty things. The motions and the activity of religion without reality. Paul said those things are empty, those things are, are vain. He says, turn to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Why did he say that? Well, there are two places in the book of Acts where the apostles preach to people who, have, who are not influenced at all by biblical theology. People who have not heard of the God of Israel, people who have not heard of the Old Testament, people who are not exposed to Jewish religion, there are two places. One is in Acts 17 in Athens, and one is here in Asia Minor, in Lystra. So what's he doing? He's telling them what God is like. You see, the Greeks and Romans believed in little gods, gods with a small g, gods 
who had jurisdiction over a small space, a space which they did not create. Maybe you had a God who had authority at the mountain. You had another God who had authority at the river. You had another God who had authority in the forest. You had another God who had authority at the sea or on the sea coast or in the ocean. Paul says, no, 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 no. There are not lots of gods. There are not lots of goddesses who are like governors of little regions. There's one God who made everything, who has authority everywhere, who's in control of everything. Now, that's not a new thought to you because you are the heirs and the beneficiaries of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It was a shocking new thought for them. Not only are we not gods, so you shouldn't worship us, but you shouldn't worship the gods you've been worshiping because they're not gods either. There's only one God, and He made everything. We've come to tell you about Him. He did not leave Himself without witness, but He has done the good things for you. Notice verse 17. Paul teaches about a God of providence. That is a God who blesses and a God who does good things for people, who sends them rain and crops and food and health. Let me tell you what an unbeliever does. An unbeliever blames God for suffering. If something bad happens, if a child is sick and dies, if there's an accident and people are killed, if there's an earthquake, if there's disaster, if there's suffering, when the unbeliever talks about God, he blames God for those things. He talks about God as if he's bad. But when something good happens, he doesn't bless God. He doesn't thank God. You see the difference. If God is responsible for the bad things, then God is also the author of the good things. How can someone blame God for suffering without worshiping God for those times when we do not suffer and those times when we're not blessed? You see, and Paul is giving God credit for the good things that happen in verse 17. Well, it says in verse 18 that even when they said, no, 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 we're not gods, don't worship us, worship the true God, it was with great difficulty that they held them back. Now, at this point, something amazing happens. Iconium is 20 miles away. And by this time, the Jews in Iconium had learned that the apostles whom they'd run out of town were making a big impact only 20 miles away in this place called Lystra. So the Jews who came all the way from Pisidian Antioch and Iconium, they came and they convinced the multitude that Paul and Barnabas were really bad guys. How did they do it? They probably did it by convincing them that Paul and Barnabas are saying that you should not worship your gods. You should not worship the pagan gods. And in that way, they turned the people away or against Paul and Barnabas. Now, these Jews are being hypocritical because those Jews also believe that those people should not worship those gods. But probably that's the only way they could have turned the crowd against Paul and Barnabas who had worked, um, who'd worked a great miracle. And so at the beginning... They were worshiping them as gods. Now they're going to kill them. They're going to sacrifice them as false gods. You see, any system which worships a man will ultimately victimize the man. The great victim of humanism is humanity. Anyone who's worshiped as a man, as a false god, will be sacrificed as a man to false gods. This is what happens in Lystra. And it's an amazing, amazing turn of events. But you see, the same spiritual error which made them want to sacrifice oxen to Paul and Barnabas, which made them want to worship Paul and Barnabas, the same spiritual error made them want to kill Paul and Barnabas. The fact that they didn't know the truth. 
the fact that they didn't know the one true God. It says in verse 19 that they stoned Paul and that they dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, first they supposed him to be a god, and he wasn't. Then they supposed him to be dead, but he wasn't. There are some Bible teachers who believe that he was dead. There are some Bible teachers who believed that what happens at the end of Acts 14 is a resurrection, that Paul was raised from the dead. In 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, Paul talks about, chapter 12, Paul talks about knowing a man who, who was taken up to the third heaven. The man he's talking about is himself. When did it happen? It may have happened when he was stoned at Lystra, where he had a vision of heaven and saw things in heaven. It may have happened at this point in Acts 14. We don't know for sure this is when it happened, but it could have happened at this time. Now here's an amazing thing. It says, when the disciples stood around him, he arose. Here's the amazing thing. He went back into the city. He didn't run away. He went back into the city. Now, if it wasn't a miraculous resurrection, it was a miraculous healing. He shouldn't have been able to stand up. He should not have been able to walk. He should not have been able to go back into the city. He may have gone back into the city to show them you didn't hurt me. My God protected me. I'm alive, and I'm not only alive, I'm healthy. He goes back into the city, and the next day he leaves, and he goes to a place called Derby. It says that after they preached in that place and they made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, the place where Paul was stoned. They returned to Iconium, the place where they were run out of. And they returned to Pisidian Antioch, the place where they had started in the region. Now this is an amazing thing, to think that you could be run out of a place, to think that people would try to kill you in a certain place, and you would go back to that place. You would go back to that place and preach. You would go back to that place and share the good news of the gospel so that those people could be shown mercy. We're going to talk about what happened because Paul did that when we get to chapter 16. Something amazing happens in chapter 16 as a result of Paul's willingness to go back into Lystra, the place where they tried to kill him. He strengthened the souls of the disciples there, verse 22. He encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. This is, this is what we're taught as Christians. We're not promised an easy path. You know, when the world advertises and when the world recruits, the world talks about all the good things that it offers. No difficulty, something easy, something good. Buy this product, watch this film, follow this lifestyle, adopt this attitude, and only good things will happen. That's what the world tells you through advertising. That's what the world tells you through recruitment. recruitment. Jesus says just the opposite. He says, if you want to follow me, that means a cross. All who seek to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer tribulation. Paul says it's through many tribulations that we will enter the kingdom of God. And he has credibility. He's just been stoned. They tried to kill him. They will continue to kill him. If someone who's led a life like that teaches others, you can be strong, even though it's hard, he has credibility. Because he's been strong, even though it's been hard. And this is the invariable experience of people who are faithful to the truth. It always happens. There's great difficulty, there's great opposition, but there's also great joy, and there's great reward. We have to ask the question, who do we want to reward us? We asked that question yesterday. 
verse 23, we learn something about the organization of the early church. They appointed elders in every church. Now, this is a controversy. Baptists normally, not all the time, but normally Baptists teach that there's one elder called a pastor. Presbyterians teach that there are many elders. Did they appoint more than one elder in, in each church? We don't know. And we don't have apostles around anymore to appoint elders. But they planted these churches. They left leaders for them. They prayed for them. They fasted for them. Then they gave them over to the Lord, and they left. They kept going. Verse 24 says, They passed through Pisidia, and they came into Pamphylia. When they'd spoken the word in Perga, they went to Italia. See, Luke is tracing their route through Asia Minor. Verse 26 said they sailed to Antioch. This is not Pisidian Antioch. This is Syrian Antioch, the Antioch which was just north of Jerusalem. Where did they start from? They started from Antioch. So they've gone to Asia Minor. They've come back. The first missionary journey begins in Acts 13.5. Thir the first missionary journey ends in Acts 14.26. Now it's over. Three of them went out. Paul, Barnabas, John, Mark. Two of them come back. Paul and Barnabas. John Mark left them in Cyprus in Acts 13.13. 13. The two of them come back. When they come back, they report to the church. The church sent them. The church prayed for them. Probably the church gave them money. The church supported them. So they meet with the church to tell them what happened. Every missionary is responsible to report back to his sending church, and that's what they did. They reported all the things that God had done with them. How he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And it says they spent a long time with the disciples. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.